Well, the biggest shortcoming, of course, is the massive increase of greenhouse gases over a period of 23 years now since we have the first major treaty that was promising a reduction of greenhouse gases to pre-industrial level. The Kyoto Protocol is, can be seen as a quite significant success. The first uh, treaty with legally binding targets and timelines has its flaws, of course. A number of countries had no targets and timelines. All developing countries, rightly so, unfortunately only in also including China and uh, India and Brazil, you know, major polluters, but nevertheless developing countries. The other major flaw, of course, that key polluters such as the United States in particular never ratified the Kyoto Pro Protocol. On the other hand, a number of European countries uh, met all the targets. Um, so there's some success there and you would expect that uh, in order to enhance and, and strengthen our regime, you would continue the Kyoto Protocol dialogue and would sharpen it up if you can. Unfortunately, the opposite has happened because a number of countries led by the US, but then also quickly followed by Canada, Japan, Australia, New Zealand and Russia declared that they no longer had any interest in the Kyoto Protocol some two years ago. And thereby, I think, opening the floodgates, meaning from now on we don't have a legally binding agreement that works and we renegotiate. So at the moment we have this uh, new age of voluntary contributions expressed to this by this acronym INDC, which stands for Intended Nationally Determined Contributions, which means that you utterly rely on the willingness of governments at the moment. And calculations have shown that it's by far not enough to um, even halfway meet the famous target of staying with an increase of two uh, degrees Celsius measured against pre-industrial times. This target in itself represents some sort of a compromise, by no means representative of the best signs av available. Now, you could say the big uh, competition is between the United States and China, the single biggest polluters, but it really is only the most um, obvious illustration of what's really wrong with the current system of negotiating climate targets. Basically what's wrong, really, that's the massive shortcoming in the way how the regime is operating, is that states consider the world's climate or the atmosphere as a sort of negotiable asset. Like you can negotiate about the feasibility of having more effective free trade regimes or not, so purely from an economic, practical point of view, they look at this, what's essentially a physical reality, what's essentially a condition of life, and certainly not negotiable. So what has yet to be dis dis disclosed to states who are notoriously obsessed with their own economic uh, competitiveness and not able to cooperate, what has yet to be understood by them is that they are no win-win situation. Economically, yes, we have this free rider problem at the moment. If you're not committing to climate change, it might get you a sort of economic edge in the short run. In the long run, however, all the data has shown us we will be all worse off, simply because the weather has been deteriorating, floods and, and all, uh, all sorts of things, right? So this kind of recognition that you can't win unless we have a very collective approach and, and take serious responsibility as a, I would call it, guardian or trustee for the atmosphere, we will not uh, get anywhere under this scenario of states being, you know, uh, the uh, key player in uh, climate change regimes. We become increasingly aware that we are all in this, that it is uh, absolutely to nobody's advantage that we uh, overlook the needs of the atmosphere. I would specifically say needs. I perceive the atmosphere like the oceans, um, like biological diversity as part of the whole global uh, natural environment and they are called in legal terms global commons. What's fundamentally missing at the moment you could describe as a sense of urgency, right? Um, in practical terms if you picture the negotiators of key states uh, in Paris, 
from the US, uh, European Union, China, Japan, um, they don't feel the sense of urgency. They are not really directly affected than many other people in the poor parts of this world. I'm coming from the South Pacific. Now New Zealand is part of the Western Club. We are not affected, strictly speaking. Consequently, New Zealand government is not concerned very much. But a little bit further north, uh, South Pacific Island states, their physical existence is at risk. So it's very obvious that um, there's a need for uh, redefining the very idea of what constitutes a nation state in terms of what responsibility a nation state really has. Now, this is quite interesting from a legal perspective that historically the idea of a sovereign nation state uh, came about um, through the Westphalian peace in 1648 when Europe was sort of entering a new peace order through the concept of state sovereignty, which is really based on the assumption that state needs to watch each other, respect each other, but reflecting a kind of conflict model, model that has worked more or less quite well for, for 200 years until the disaster occurred, really to na through nationalism and this kind of con conflict model sort of proved its point really. Um, not uh, providing for mechanisms to stop sort of ambitious superpowers such as Germany um, from um, playing to the rules of international law. So this conflict model is underpinning the current system of international law still. And this is rather ridiculous. Uh, what has yet to happen, and I'm rather optimistic there because um, uh, my optimism comes from the fact that, you know, the, looking back to the history, we have learned in the past we have learned things like good governance should be based on what we call democracy today, that people are able to control themselves, a massive achievement in the history of civilization, or that we have human rights, that we respect each other as being equal, another you know, uh, uh, achievement that we all should be proud of. And I can't quite see why we are not able to see that uh, the globalized world of today has created a new situation that's uh, uh, characterized by physical realities. It's not just economic uh, globalization that we need to control, but fundamentally, of course, the globe is one or the earth is one and the world is plenty. And in order to so overcome this mismatch, mismatch, we need to adopt a thinking that nation states, in order to flourish, will only be able to do so through the cooperation with others. In other words, you can't win on your own. Um, and this is really the, the sort of challenge. Uh, on the one hand side, we have clear science, we have a clear morality, arguably, that's based on the observation that the world is one and that we need to consider the atmosphere as a global commons requiring responsibility of all of us. But the law is not there yet. In legal terms, it requires two things and they can be in incrementally sort of phased in. One is a subtle shift from the old outdated concept of state sovereignty to what I call smart sovereignty. That states are smart enough through thinking but also through their legal constructs and perhaps through some mechanisms of the United Nations, smart enough to realize that they need to be sovereign in some de to some degree, for example controlling import and export, not you know, allowing multinational comp companies to coming in. Uh, freely and then sort of move out, out whenever they, they, they play. So we need some more um, sovereignty there or, if you like, confidence of states and they can cooperate together against multinational companies, for example. So more sovereignty there, which has been lost to a degree, and less sovereignty in other areas where it's really stupid, right, when it comes to climate change, for example. Uh, There's an almost ridiculous situation that states pretend as if they have full control over, you know, whether the climate will, will function or not. It obviously can only function if we truly give up uh, sovereignty or transfer, if you like. The European Union is an example of such a transfer of sovereignty. So in this um, scenario of climate change, I would envisage an increased role of United Nations uh, institutions. That's the second aspect. So state so sovereignty, number one. And the other aspect, United Nations, um, adopts new idea about uh, more effective institutions, such as a World Climate Authority, for example. Um, the United Nations has a, quite a proud history of having created institutions based on trusteeship um, mandates. 
such as, for example, the United Nations Trusteeship Council that has worked very well, where UN member states were acting on behalf of 11 uh, trusteeship uh, territories, territories around the world, basically acting for the best interests and the good of those people in other places. So uh, the model would then suggest, or the experience of the United Nations, that a World Climate Authority or a World Environmental Organization, both uh, are currently not existing, could increasingly adopt such trusteeship functions. And then, for example, through monitoring, uh, monitoring processes, remind uh, states to do better, like the WHO does at the moment, uh, or the World Trade Organization. If we increasingly understand that, you know, what's at stake here, uh, the atmosphere is crumbling, so to speak, we need to be dead serious, literally dead serious, about giving it a status, a legal status as a global commons that requires a governance model based on trusteeship. In my book, Earth Governance, I spent a lot of time elaborating the history of the commons in nations, in parts of the world, within communities, then applying it to the global level to realize that the United Nations in it, uh, itself has a certain degree of history of recognizing the importance of the global commons. It's really states, or more precisely, the thinking of state leaders or what they perceive to be their duty. Uh, one of the, um, my heroes in environmental matters is a person called um, Jim McNeil, a Canadian diplomat who was the lead author of the Brundtland Report back in the 1980s, um, proclaiming the idea of sustainable development. And Jim McNeil was a very, or still is, he's in his 80s, a uh, very committed um, environmental leader. And when I talked to him uh, recently about the prospects of our future as humanity, he was uh, quite relaxed in some way and said, well, partly we rely on our intelligence and we are creative people after all, uh, but most importantly, we have a big ally and that's Mother Earth. Uh, it's a bit sort of sad and, you know, if that's the only major ally, ob obviously climate change is taking its course right now. It will do so in the future even more so. And of course, we will learn. Um, but I can't quite, you know, be uh, con reconciled with the prospect that we can only learn through being damaged and being, you know, hurt in a situation where we have all the data, we have even support among uh, so many uh, people around the world for really being more ambitious in our efforts to protect the world's climate.